well, um, is this, are we on? We're good? Okay. Um, well, good evening. I'm not Bob Costanza. Um, I've got the gray hair and everything, but that's it. That's the only similarity. I'm Peter Schoonmaker from Illahi, and we've been kind of um, collaborating with uh, Institute for Sustainable Solutions on this, just getting uh, the word out about the solution seminars. And um, a couple of uh, just items of interest. So a at any rate, Illahi will um, uh, will continue the collaboration. We're going to uh, run our winter series, uh, Searching for Solutions, uh, uh, Innovation for Public Good. And we're about to announce the, the lineup for that. And it'll be the same kind of deal for students. You come and you get credit uh, for the Illahi series as well. Um, no. Uh, uh, talk next week, of course, Thanksgiving week, but then Gail Acterman will finish up this uh, terms uh, series on December, on Wednesday, December 1st. And then a, a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements as well. We all need to turn our cell phones off, not, not silence them, but like I'm doing right now. So if you can all do this with me, off cell phone off. The reason is because these things uh, inter will interfere with our speaker's wireless mic and we'll have that kind of same off and on thing that we had last week. So let's turn those off. Um, and then uh, after uh, Peter Barnes talk tonight, there will be Q&A at the mic and we really need you to come up to the mic to ask your question uh, because we're recording webcast but also recording and we won't get your question if you're just standing away from the mic. So you've got to come up to the mic to have your question actually make it uh, onto the recording. Uh, so thanks for doing that. Uh, and now to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Peter Barnes. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, writer, uh, founded and led several successful companies that you've heard of um, and probably were customers of, I hope. Uh, and at present, he's a senior fellow at the Tomales Bay Institute in Point Reyes Station, California. Uh, in 1976, he co-founded a worker-owned solar energy company in San Francisco, uh, which was, um, could we say, um, destroyed by Ronald Reagan uh, in 1981 when he took away tax credits for uh, solar installations. In 1983, he co-founded Working Assets Money Fund and then subsequently served as the president for Working Assets Long Distance. And in 1995, he was named Socially Responsible Entrepreneur of the Year for Northern California. He served on numerous boards, and I mean numerous boards, uh, including, check this out, the National Cooperative Bank, the California State Assistance Fund for Energy, the California Solar Indus Industry Association, Business for Social Responsibility, the Rainbow Workers Cooperative, Techmar, Redefining Progress, the Family Violence Prevention Fund, I'm about halfway through, uh, Public Media Center, Turn Off TV Network, the Noise Pollution Clearinghouse, Greenpeace International, the California Tax Reform Association, and the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He's the author of four books, including his latest, um, Capital Three, Capitalism 3.0, um, Great read. I've still got like lots of little scribblings all over this, and I still want to know how are we going to do this. I mean, who's who's writing this operating system? Um, and I know you'll answer that tonight. And uh, has a fifth book coming out with the title that you see right there in front of you. So please welcome Peter Barnes. Uh. Oops. Hello, H how's this sound working? Good, everybody, cell phone off, no texting? Great. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, every time I hear that list of boards I've been on, I think, well, it just confirms my current policy of not serving on any more boards. But um, when I was invited by Bob Costanza to give this talk here, Bob said that I should talk no more than one third about problems and at least two thirds about solutions. Maybe you're familiar with that formula. Anyway, I'm going to try to do a little better than that. 
So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, what I think is the big problem we face today, and then quickly segue into a, some ideas about solving it. Um, I don't know if I'll have all the answers. In fact, I know I won't, but uh, I'll at least have a, a, a start. So on the problem, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Vermont uh, talking with a man named Gus Speth, who many of you may have heard of if you're students of uh, sustainability. Uh, and um, Gus just wrote a book about a year ago called Bridge uh, to the End of the World, which begins with a two-page spread of graphs, uh, I think 16 graphs in all, each graph uh, tracking a different uh, trend um, having to do with human disruption of Gaia's ecosystem. If you have, don't know what Gaia means, I'm going to come to that in a second, but bear with me. I'll just say, for now, we'll say planetary ecosystems. Um, and all these graphs, you know, the y-axis was different on all the graphs, but they all looked like this, uh, the hockey stick look, um, which is to say they all kind of, you know, the bottom axis is time, and they all start off you know, horizontal, essentially, and then in the last 50 years, they just shoot up to near to vertical. And that includes everything from population to carbon dioxide emissions to deforestation to fishery uh, uh, exhaustion to species uh, extinction and so forth. There's just all these trends that have that shape. And the technical word for this is uh, asymptotic. Uh, but what it really means in, in, the, in, in the natural world is that we are heading off a cliff. Uh, and every instant that we keep going like this, we, the, the crash approaches faster. It, it's, we're at the exponential part of this curve now. So these graphs. Um, don't represent the problem. They are sim they, they show symptoms of the problem. So let's be clear about that. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem. Well, there's many ways to describe it, but um, the way I look at the problem is that we have a simultaneous failure of markets and government. It's a double failure. And these are our two primary institutions. Um, and when they both fail in combination, we're in deep trouble. Uh, market failure has turned our global economy into a runaway steam engine devouring nature's gifts and heading for a cliff without any breaks. And it would be bad enough if all we had to deal with was market failure and we could look to government to be the deux ex machina that comes in and fixes the market failures. But unfortunately, that isn't the way the world seems to be working these days. Government turns out to be really no better than markets at putting future generations and the earth over short-term business interests. And this government failure, as I think all of us now recognize, is rooted in the fact that even in our so-called democracy, uh, the government is, is essentially, effectively controlled by people who profit from this acceleration of the steam engine. And hence, we have all these multiple hockey sticks that we see. OK, so that's the problem in a nutshell. Uh, it is a dire problem. And there is no simple fix for it. So I'm not going to promise you a, a quick fix. But what I want to do for the rest of my talk is 
uh, talk about how we can deal with this double failure. And I want to start by uh, quoting Danella Meadows, who is maybe somebody else you've, you're familiar with, um, and her answer to the question of where to intervene to solve a problem, and a big problem. And her answer was, look for leverage points, places where a small change in the system design or code can lead to a large shift in behavior. Clearly, that's what we need. We don't have time anymore to tinker around on the edges with little incremental things. And that um, leads me to the whole notion of, of, of the economic operating system, which is not as obvious as Windows, but our economy has an operating system, and we need to understand it, and then we need to upgrade it so that we can continue to have uh, an economy that doesn't destroy the planet. Uh, so the question I want to pose and, and, and try to address today is, um, if we have to upgrade our economic operating system to avoid destroying our host planet, what should that upgrade look like and how should we go about installing it? So, as a way to answer this question, I, I, I'm working on a, a book, as Peter suggested, which I'm calling Guyanomics. Okay. And um, when I talk about Gaia, how many of you here know what I'm talking about when I talk about Gaia? Okay, that's most of you. That's good. But not all of you. So um, Gaia is the Greek goddess uh, of the earth, or, or the, the goddess who gave birth to the earth. Uh, and um, she became a little more well known in the modern era, uh, thanks to James Lovelock, who came up with what, in the, a scientist who, who came up with what is known as the Gaia hypothesis, although it's now gone beyond a hypothesis, I think it's called a theory now because it's more or less been accepted. Um, and he, I am using Gaia in, in the same sense that Lovelock does, to, as, a, as a metaphor uh, for the complex living biosphere that we humans are a small but very disruptive part of. And that biosphere consists of all the physical uh, uh, parts, the atmosphere, the water, the forests, and those uh, well, forests are living. Uh, but there's physical, non-living parts and living parts. And, and the Gaia hypothesis is that the, this combination of the non-living and the living parts of the biosphere has a way of self-regulating lots of things, including climate and temperature and ocean acidity and things like that. Uh, in such a way that it maintains the livability of the biosphere. If, if uh, Gaia didn't have this self-regulating capacity, uh, there wouldn't be life on Earth right now because, the, among other things, the, the heat from the sun has increased 25% over uh, the last couple of billion years. Uh, and yet this self-regulating capacity of Gaia has kept our climate within a relatively narrow range that allows life to continue. And life, including algae and trees and other living things, and more recently humans in a, in a negative way, is, is very much a part of this self-regulatory system. Anyway, so I use Gaia in that sense. And I use it for the same reason that Lovelock did, even though he took a lot of crap for using it because it was sort of a non-scientific uh, term. But uh, I, I'm, I, Lovelock has said that he's glad he used that term because it has helped uh, popularize uh, his theory. And that's why I'm doing it. Because there is something, I think there's, there, uh, when you talk about 
gods or goddesses, you're getting into the realm of myth, which is non-scientific, it's non-economic, but it, it, um, it addresses some sort of uh, inbuilt human need for stories that are, that explain, that are simple and memorable, explain where we are and what we need to do. So that's why I'm, I'm using this term. Um, so Gaianomics is uh, a sort of a subset of economics, as I see it. Uh, and it's a, it's a species of what E.F. Schumacher uh, called meta-economics. You know, there's microeconomics and there's macroeconomics. These are all taught here, I'm sure. Uh, but there needs to be uh, another part of economics, meta-economics, which is about the relationship of the human economy as a whole to the larger biosphere of which it is a subsystem. And so Gaianomics is, is about how to make our cumulative economic activity uh, consistent in harmony with Gaia. Um, now, before going further, I do want to introduce three uh, more uh, metaphors. Oh, okay, let me just back up. Uh, the sort of the, what the core of Gaianomics, I, I've said it, it's a species of metanomics, but what is the key to it? Key to it, as we will see when I get into it a little more, is that it treats Gaia as an actual economic stakeholder. Not a theoretical one, but an actual one. Now, uh, how are we gonna do that, I will explain. But that's really the key element. And another key element is the notion of an actual contract, an intergenerational contract, um, which is not a new idea. Edmund Burke uh, said this hundreds of years ago, that society is a contract between those who came before, those who are alive now, and those who are yet to be born. So that's a nice theory, but the problem is we don't have any actual mechanism for enforcing this contract. So part of Gaianomics is to create mechanisms that will actually enforce this contract, this intergenerational contract. Now, three more metaphors to throw at you as we get into this. One is the metaphor or concept of divine right. Okay, what is that? Um, um, Marjorie Kelly wrote a book called The Divine Right of Capital, which is a great book. And um, she talks about how in every society, there is one set of rights that trumps all the others and usually does so with the claim that it has to be this way. And in the Middle Ages, of course, it was kings and their hereditary rights who had the so-called divine right. And in our age, it is capital that has the divine right. Um, and what this means is that capital owners, with their proxies, their agents, in the form of corporations, um, can run around the planet and basically do whatever they want um, as long as they make capital grow and the people who own the capital richer. Their legal rights actually trump everybody else's and they have constitutional protection that property can't be, private property can't be taken without due process and all sorts of other protections that Gaia, the Earth, doesn't have. So um, one of the key things we have to do to fix our operating system, our economic operating system, is to make sure that Gaia has at least equal rights to capital and probably uh, superior rights. That Gaia, being a goddess, should clearly have the divine right in our economic system. 
Okay, another metaphor I want to throw out there as we get going here is, is the metaphor of the governor, the steam engine governor. Um, now, uh, the steam engine governor is a, a mechanical system that uh, represents a negative or virtuous feedback loop. You've got this steam engine chugging along, and, and if you put too much uh, coal or wood in the boiler, it's going to go too fast. But because of this mechanism that James Watt invented, uh, if, that, if it, the engine starts going too fast, this mechanism will, will reduce the flow of fuel into the chamber, and the whole thing will automatically slow down and um, self-regulate as to speed. So that's a very nice concept that it would be kind of nice if we could apply that to our economic system. We do have one kind of mechanism like that, which is the Federal Reserve System, which, um, uh, at least in theory, uses its control of the money supply to crank things down or sometimes up, uh, depending on how fast the economic engine is going at any given time. And then the third metaphor is something called Daisy World. All right, how many of you are familiar with the Daisy World model that James Lovelock uh, developed as part of his Gaia theory? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, well, let me try to explain this as, as simply as I can. Um, Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis that the Earth, with the living and non-living uh, elements combined, self-regulates for temperature was very critically received when it first came out. I think it was in the 80s or 70s. Um, and a lot of scientists said, well, that's impossible. You know, there, there, there is no way that the Earth can act as a kind of intelligent organism that self-regulates itself without any, you know, brain or or system in charge of the whole thing. It just doesn't make any sense. So uh, to refute that counter-argument to his hypothesis, Lovelock developed a computer model um, called Daisy World, where he uh, said, okay, well, let's imagine a very Earth-like planet, which is sitting in space and receiving heat from an outside source, um, and it has two species, white daisies and black daisies. And they each, um, uh, you know, are, are similar. They're daisies. They're living things that thrive at slightly different temperatures uh, and have slightly different heat-reflecting and heat-absorbing properties. And so if you, and then you take the external heat source and you ramp it up, which mimics what's actually happening with the sun, and, and then you see what happens to the temperature in this little um, um, sort of simplified uh, planet. And what happens, it turns out, is very interesting, is that the, in the early years when um, uh, the world is colder, uh, you have more black daisies that absorb more heat. And then as the planet gets warmer, uh, you have more white daisies, which reflect more heat. And the end result is that the temperature kind of self-regulates for a long time uh, until at some point when the external heat source gets so high, the system crashes. But so this was an example, and it since, there, there's, there's since been much more complex models developed which confirmed this, that um, even though the daisies are just operating independently, evolving according to their own DNA, they don't know, understand anything about the, the larger system they're part of, nevertheless, um, the whole system does self-regulate for temperature. And uh, why this happens, nobody really knows. I mean, why 
But you know, we can see in our own bodies, human body, we self-regulate for temperature. So it, it's it's a credible uh, theory, and um, there is some way in which um, complex systems have can have they don't always have but can have an emergent property that self-regulates for various things like speed and temperature so um, now we go from those three metaphors to looking at the economic operating system um, and let me just repeat the initial question that I posed, which is what would an upgraded operating system look like and how would we install it? And let's look just for one second at our current operating system and see what the problem seems to be. Uh, the problem seems to be that there are two key rules or algorithms in our present operating system which lead inexorably to all those hockey sticks that we talked about. Uh, one is that corporations must maximize short-term profit. That's what they are designed to do. And the second is that the price of nature is zero. There's also in our current operating system a general absence of speed limits or governing governor type mechanisms to uh, regulate speed or temperature. Uh, and, and, and the combination of these rules and lack of rules is what leads inexorably to the market failures that we have. So how, or, or perhaps I should say who, is going to stop or slow, or at least slow down this juggernaut of capitalism. And as I said at the beginning, you know, it's not going to be government. Uh, at best, in dealing with Gaia, government is always behind the curve, too little, too late. Uh, its, its ability to regulate corporations is bound by the corporation's ability to dominate government, which seems to increase every day, which leaves us in a you know, really tough situation. We are essentially up a polluted planet without any paddles. So there's, what are we going to do? So this is what I propose. And as I said at the beginning, this is not a complete solution. All the details are not uh, figured out, but it's a process that can lead us in the right direction. And I, my, my basic proposal is that we start creating white daisies, economic white daisies. And what are these white daisies? Okay, think about corporations. Corporations are fictitious entities. They're artificial entities that we started creating a couple hundred years ago. Uh, we gave them certain rights and powers. They have the right, to, you know, they have perpetual life. They are self-governing. They have limited liability and all a bunch of other things like that. In fact, you know, now the Supreme Court has said that they're people who have all the rights of living breathing people, and so forth. So we've created this, these fictitious entities called corporations that have multiplied and spread all across the globe. So what I'm thinking, OK, we've, now, we've got to create some white daisies that, will also, that are also fictitious entities uh, but, but also have real power, re have real, the same sort of equivalent uh, property rights and uh, governance, self-governance, and perpetual life uh, that corporations do. And their role is to be proxies for Gaia, just as corporations are proxies for capital. Uh, and 
if enough of these daisies can be created and if they can self-replicate and spread over, let's say, the next 50 years, then maybe, if we're lucky, we can wind up in 50 years with a kind of a self-regulating market economic system uh, where the black daisies and the white daisies will sort of balance each other out and we can continue to have a kind of dynamic economy, but it will live within the limits, operate within the limits of the Earth's ecosystems. So, now, diving down just a little deeper, okay, if corporations are the black daisies, who are the white daisies? And um, this is where we need a lot of creativity. I don't have all the details and all the answers, but as a conceptual model to work with, let's use the existing legal institution of the trust, nonprofit trust. Um, and there's quite a lot of these around. You know, you can think of the Nature Conservancy as a trust that owns bits and pieces of nature on behalf of future generations and is, is mandated to protect those bits and pieces that it owns. So you can have trust for land and you can have trust for water or in air and forests and soil. So there's a lot of and a lot of these prototypes already exist. So this isn't, and, and the whole legal system for trusts already exists. So we're not starting from scratch here. Now, um, there are certain principles that would uh, guide these trusts that we want to act as white daisies, as, as proxies for Gaia operating within a kind of capitalist economy. So one of their main principles is to enforce this, this, this intergenerational contract. So the, these trusts are accountable, legally accountable, to future generations in the same way that corporations are legally accountable to shareholders. It's called a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, if, just as if a corporate director does something that goes against the interests of shareholders, that director can be sued um, for violation of, of his or her fiduciary responsibility. In the same way, if you've got a trust that's responsible for protecting some air or water or land, um, those trustees have a fiduciary responsibility to future generations. If they violate that uh, fiduciary responsibility, they can be sued, not by the future generation because they're not alive yet, but by somebody, you know, like Earth Justice or uh, NRDC, you know, representing future generations. Okay, so that's one principle, that these trusts have a, uh, an accountability to future generations. Sometimes these trusts must limit, reduce, and charge for human or corporate use of their asset, the, the, the particular piece of Gaia that they're responsible for, and also there's legal accountability. Those are the key principles of, of these white daisies. Now, um, interestingly, I guess, um, in thinking about all of this, I, I came to see that in some way in my own life, uh, I have been experimenting with various possible white daisies for a long time. Um, and Peter mentioned some of the things I've done and I'm not gonna repeat it, but uh, uh, what I have come to conclude, however, you know, after doing a socially responsible business and cooperative banks and Greenpeace and things like that is that um, actually none of them are <laughs> white daisies, unfortunately. Uh, and 
when you start thinking about it, you know, even the White House is not a white daisy. Um, so we've got to do even better than, uh, uh, you know, I've done or, you know, uh, We've, we, we've just got to come up with some better models. And as I said, there are some actual existing models out there. And uh, I mentioned the Nature Conservancy. There are many land trusts that are much smaller than the Nature Conservancy. There are probably quite a few in Oregon. EcoTrust, which is based here in Portland, has a lot of initiatives relating to water and forestry and fishing, which are very much attempts to create white daisies. Um, there's an agricultural land trust in Marin County, where I live in California, which has done a great job of buying up conservation easements on agricultural land uh, and thereby preserving it in perpetuity as agricultural land. And the other model that I, I will mention it doesn't actually exist yet, but it's um, in play, so to speak. And that's the, uh, well, it started off uh, called the Sky Trust model. This was something that emerged out of a book that I wrote about 10 years ago called Who Owns the Sky? And, and in it I said, well, if we're going to deal with climate change, we have to start from the assumption that the atmosphere is a commons, it's a gift of Gaia, if you will, to all of us. And if anybody owns it, we all own it equally. And if we start with that assumption and then move on to the next assumption that we have to reduce the dumping of carbon into the atmosphere because the capacity of the atmosphere to store this carbon is limited and we're getting very close to the limit, well, then you could auction parking tickets, so to speak, um, and, um, and gradually reduce the number of parking tickets till eventually you get down to a sustainable level of carbon in the atmosphere. Now, if you do that, of course, you're actually going to get a flow of revenue, uh, which is essentially rent. You're, you're taking um, this property, if you want to think of it in those terms, that we all own, the atmosphere, and uh, uh, think of it as a parking lot, and uh, there's more demand than there is supply for parking spaces, so as you crank down actually the supply of parking spaces, the rent's going to go up. And we're actually talking about big bucks there. And so there arises a, a question which environmentalists have tended to ignore, which is the question of rent. Ecosystem rent, Gaia rent, I don't know, nature's rent, you can call it lots of different things. Uh, but it's rent, and it involves putting prices on our use of Gaia. Uh, and um, from Gaia's standpoint, we actually want these prices to be as high as possible. So that, that discourages as much as possible uh, uh, our, our use or overuse of Gaia. And um, I'm sure if you've been uh, studying with uh, Bob Costanza, you understand about externalities and internalizing the cost of externalities. Well, that's what charging rent is all about. It's about um, having markets set prices for what are now externalities. And, and it's these trusts that actually, it's not a bunch of, uh, economists sitting in front of a computer trying to calculate what is the proper price of some ecosystem service. That is a bit too abstract and it, and, and it doesn't translate into an actual price that corporations would have to pay in the marketplace. But if you have an entity that actually owns the rights and, lets, and, 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 and can limit their supply, 
and let the market set the price, you have a market price that corporations or anybody, uh, corporations will pass it on to the rest of us. So it's not necessarily a cost that corporations will bear. It's ultimately a cost that we will bear. But this rent is really important. It's something that we have to look at. And my uh, general approach to that rent is that it, it basically belongs to all of us. And most of it, if not all of us, should be, all of it, should be returned to us equally in the form of dividends that could be paid very simply, electronically, wired to the bank accounts of everybody who has a social security account, even to a debit card. This is how social security benefits, which I'm proud to say I now receive, old enough to receive, this is how they're distributed every month. It's a simple thing to do. Um, so the SkyTrust model was, was proposed and, and got in, involved in, in the climate change debate. Um, it morphed a little bit and, and has, is now called cap and dividend, but it's the same concept where uh, the government would in effect act as the trustee. Uh, it would auction a declining supply of carbon emission rights and then return the money to all of us as dividends so that as the price of fossil fuels goes up, which it must and should, we actually get more money back and um, that protects the pocketbooks of the middle class uh, as we go through this transition to a post-carbon economy. Um, so I won't go into all the details unless you want to ask me more about that. We can talk about it more in the question and answer period. But um, there was a bill introduced in Congress in this last session that was co-sponsored by Senator Cantwell from Washington and Senator Collins, a Republican from Maine, that was a cap and dividend bill. It died along with the cap and trade bill that was sponsored by Kerry Lieberman et al. Um, but it's going to be, the cap and dividend bill is going to be reintroduced next year. It will have more sponsors. It seems to be gaining some traction now that cap and trade the difference between cap and dividend and cap and trade is that cap and trade creates this whole big complicated system that is hugely gameable by Wall Street and polluters uh, that basically gives the rent that we're talking about to polluters as opposed to giving it back to us. So that's the basic difference. Um, Just to make one further point, there's a difference between the two kinds of trusts I've been talking about. The, the land trust model or kind of trust which actually needs revenue in order to acquire pre-existing property rights and hold and manage them on behalf of Gaia and future generations versus, say, something like a sky trust or air trust, whatever you want to call it, where the trust starts off with property rights and then rents them. So it has its own revenue stream from the get-go, and that revenue stream grows over time and becomes a big deal that we have to deal with. Anyway, let me conclude. What can we, what can you do to fix the market failures that are devouring our planet? And what I would say to you essentially is go out and create white daisies. Do this at whatever level you want. Do it locally, do it regionally, do it nationally. Um, get for Gaia the same rights that corporations currently enjoy. Build um, ecologies of trusteeship that actually involve more than just trusts and trustees. It involves citizens and these nonprofit groups that act as watchdogs and 
Obviously, you need government and courts to enforce uh, the legal accountability of the trusts. But anyway, the, go create some white daisies. And uh, if you do this, uh, I can't guarantee that it's going to save the planet. But I can't think of anything more fruitful that you can do with your lives and, and your educations. And I think there is a chance uh, that, although things look grim at this very moment, that we are approaching a period of nonlinear change where if the base is there, if the groundwork is done, if there are enough white daisies out there, there can suddenly be an explosion of these white daisies that will possibly save the planet. Thank you. So uh, please, if you have questions, uh, come on up to the microphone. Good. So we'll uh, start right away. Um, Lawrence Lessig recently came here, and he did a lot of uh, common resource work uh, with the whole intellectual property front. And he's re recently changed his focus to focusing on campaign finance reform. And I'm wondering, in regards to your leverage points metaphor, if uh, you see that as a linchpin as well in getting some of this work done, or if that's something that maybe we should focus on later. Thanks. No, that, that is crucial. Uh, I completely agree with that, because that, that addresses the government failure problem, which I didn't really talk about here, but I completely agree with Lessig and you that that, that is essential. Uh, because creating these white daisies, you know, fixing the market failure, I've talked about it in a somewhat simplistic way uh, as if it didn't require any government involvement. It does require government involvement. Minimal government involvement, but essential. In other words, once these daisies are set up, they can be self-governing and self-perpetuating, but getting them set up in the first place is where we need legislation at all at different levels. And so you need kind of a one-time breakthrough, political breakthrough, to uh, get these white daisies or many of them set up. Some you can set up under existing uh, law. You don't need additional legislation. But the really big ones, you do need additional legislation. And as we learned in this past year, uh, trying to get a climate bill through Congress, um, as long as government is so completely controlled by the corporations that are profiting from the current uh, exploitation of resources, whether it's oil or coal or the atmosphere, you know, we can't really have that political breakthrough which is necessary. So by all means, campaign finance reform, go for it. Hi. Um, on that note, um, I mean, I understand we need to work on different levels uh, for the end result that we want, but uh, could you talk a little bit more about if we need a political breakthrough, a legislative breakthrough, um, uh, how that, how we achieve that by finding a leverage point, if there is one, because obviously we've tried and failed in the past, and I'm, you know, like, a lot of us, I'm afraid that'll just keep happening. Well, um, that's a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, what can I say? I mean, you know, we all are in this state, which I hope is temporary, of. of despair, you might say, because uh, we thought we had achieved a breakthrough in 2008, and it didn't really work out as we had hoped. Uh, so it's a little hard to say exactly what we should do to uh, get a, a real breakthrough. Uh, 
I don't have a prescription for that. And in fact, um, my belief is that, I mean, the last time, we've had a couple of breakthroughs in the last century. You know, we certainly had one in the 30s with the New Deal and Roosevelt. You could argue that we had one briefly in the 60s with uh, LBJ for a few years before the Vietnam War uh, ruined it. But we got Civil Rights Act, um, Medicare, War on Poverty, a bunch of big things through in the mid-60s. Um, we really haven't had one since then. But it is, uh, and, and one, and so my basic thought is that the reason we had such a big breakthrough in the 30s was, well, we had a big collapse. We had 25% unemployment. We had fascism and communism and all sorts of things going on. Uh, labor unions were, were, were really gathering strength. Uh, and uh, uh, that made it imperative, really, that, that Roosevelt act in a dramatic way. And, it, and, and the people supported it uh, overwhelmingly because they were desperate. The problem now seems to be that 10% unemployment isn't enough. Uh, and especially when we have the exceedingly clever and powerful forces of rich, the rich and the big corporations and the media, Fox News and whatnot, that are, are doing an incredibly effective job of deceiving ordinary people about what their actual interests are. And, uh, you know, ordinary people have been made to believe that government is the problem when government is not really the problem. It's a necessary tool to solving the problem, but uh, a lot of people have been brainwashed. Anyway, so what I'm saying, I guess, is that we may just have to wait till the crisis gets worse. But even if that is what has to be done, uh, we have to be ready. And uh, I, I think most of our work, rather than, than outlining a political strategy, which I am not qualified to do, uh, I think what we really ought to be spending our time and energy doing is being ready for whenever the next opportunity comes up. And it'll probably be brought on by an even deeper crisis than we face today. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really liked your, uh, the two algorithms that, that you mentioned. Uh, it was the, the corp corporations must earn profit, uh, well, corporations must earn profit in short term, that's a bad algorithm, and uh, prices of uh, nature is zero, that's another bad algorithm. And um, so, so that idea I, I kind of like and I understand. Um, one thing that, that um, I guess, makes me feel that potentially that's not going enough is because you're talking about, or the name of the book is, is changing the platform, changing the operating system. And, and I wonder if it is possible to change the operating system by changing a few algorithms, even though, if, even if they are key leverage points. Um, and then you kind of touched upon um, the, the whole trust system. Um, and that, that's really interesting to me because it, I feel it touches, uh, the whole question of private property, which I think is part of the operating system, um, the whole concept of being able to own nature. Um, and so, uh, I, I don't know, there, there's, um, could, you, could you maybe talk about the relationship to private property in the new operating system? Yes, that, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> in my previous book, Capitalism 3.0, the subtitle of that is A Guide to Reclaiming the Commons. And I talk about common property there, um, not as an alternative to private property, but as a complement to private property. Uh, and I argue, which is, is very much what I'm saying here with these trusts, that um, we have to in some sense, propertize nature in order to save her. 
And this sounds a little counterintuitive and in some you know, philosophical sense unattractive because we like to think about, well, as Chief Seattle said, you know, who can own the air, the water, da, da, da. Um, and, uh, but my conclusion is that we do have to propertize, but not privatize, if you can appreciate the distinction, um, certain bits of nature and turn them into property owned by these trusts that have a different accountability than corporations or individuals. Um, and that that is actually the key to protecting nature. Um, so the um, getting back to the algorithms, uh, what the, these new forms of common property or trust property would do would be to make the price of nature greater than zero, a lot greater than zero. So it would change that particular algorithm, which is very much at the root of many of our problems. It wouldn't change the other algorithm that corporations are these profit-maximizing automatons, that would remain a part of the system. But um, it would be offset and counterbalanced by the, the higher prices that they have to pay and the limits that would be put on their actual physical use of various ecosystems in such a way that uh, you could have both. You'd have the corporate algorithm as still part of this operating system, but you'd also have this trust with a different algorithm that's part of the uh, operating system. So the two of those playing off each other would hopefully create a kind of a sustainable uh, economy with the higher prices being the kind of the way the trusts and the corporations, the trust, the way the trusts send the signals to the corporations to behave themselves even while they continue to maximize profit. Yes. It was really inspiring, your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, Portland State Technology Management Program. Um, I really liked the analogy that you used for Gaia. It's really nice to be reminded in a poetic way also. I'm curious, uh, you just made a remark in your last answer to the previous question. Actually, that's what really triggered the question in my mind. Um, I'm personally working on for my thesis, how to internalize those externalities that we're really avoiding to see. And I have a background in finance also, and engineering. So uh, having come from that whole background, I really see the whole profit definition that we have is the tremendous biggest challenge that we need to shift our minds in the way that the corporates operate. Otherwise, I really see... Um, like that idealistic, trusty uh, perspective being ruined by those profit concepts that's running the corporates. That's, I just wanted to uh, maybe um, hear what you would, how you would integrate it to without us changing the profits. What is really, what should be the profit? Is it really m m money? at this point, because there, I don't see any way that if we change our uh, metrics, there could be a way that we could really materialize what we are longing for. That is a very good question, uh, which I thought... If I was too enthusiastic <laughs> with the <laughs> question, but I really... No, no, that's fine. So um, hours and yeah, I, no, I've thought about that question a lot uh, over the years. And, you know, I was involved in several uh, socially responsible businesses, which uh, all had multiple bottom lines, you know, thought of themselves as having multiple bottom lines. Um, 
yes, we have to make a profit, but we also want to do the right thing for our employees and for the planet. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I co have come to accept, I think, that that doesn't work. I mean, that um, it can work in a few isolated cases. It can work in mostly for small privately held companies where there's a small group of like-minded owners who feel this way, that they want to do something good. But basically, when you get into the large corporations, the publicly traded corporations, where Wall Street is essentially driving them, um, it doesn't work, and it can't work, and that's okay. You know, In other words, the notion that uh, a corporation can do anything else other than maximize profit, I think, is a delusion. That That is what they do, and I don't think they can do, they can't chew gum and walk at the same time. They really need, and they're run by a bottom line, a single bottom line, no matter what they say, and print all these fancy social responsibility reports on 100% recycled paper with their soy-based ink. It's all yep. BS, basically. And, and so um, I think we need to accept that and work with it. And, and the way I suggest that we do that is to force these corporations to internalize these external costs while they are seeking to maximize their profit. And if we can do that, then I think we've solved the problem. I mean, it's not easy to do that, but if we could, that would solve the problem. I just wanted to clarify, like, I'm not against wealth or anything, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I really believe in that we need more wealth generation. Yeah. It's just a matter of how to bring everyone to a certain understanding that we really need to... Um, maybe introduce new metrics in addition to profit. That might be something that I'm coming to, like in a way that to come up with an integrated integ indicator that solid, solidly measures what is the outcome right. from another perspective as well, rather than only yeah. CSR <laughs> reports, right. which are not necessarily quantifiable. Right. Thanks okay, much. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Barnes, you have given me hope for years. I think your your perspective is the most eloquent one I've I've come across as far as bringing together a realistic view of of who we are as people, what's going to actually work um, in terms of of um, transforming our economic system and who we are as economic our economic relationships. Um, it's just beautiful. I thank you so much. I'm curious. I'm, my heart is heavy, though, because uh, I, in the last year, um, well, I'll get to the point. My question is, what have you learned? Who, what have you learned from the Clear Act's failure, mm. as you called it? I didn't realize it actually failed. Um, I thought it was still in the books, but so much has happened lately. But what... What do the opponents, what rubs them the wrong, the worst, from what you're saying? And what yeah. can we learn about making it more politically yeah. effective if this is going to be proposed in the future? Is that clear? Yes, that's a good question. Um, just for everybody's sake, the CLEAR Act is the sort of acronym for the cap and dividend bill that was, I mentioned, that was... Um, co-sponsored by Senator Cantwell and Senator Collins. Um, well, um, first of all, yes, it didn't pass this year. Um, so in that sense, it failed. But uh, it's, it's a long ball game. Um, and I think in, if, if we look at it as a longer ball game, uh, the CLEAR Act or something like it uh, still has uh, some prospects. In fact, I think in, in a perverse sort of way, it's actually gaining ground because the big problem with passing the CLEAR Act this year was not that there was anything wrong with the CLEAR Act. It was the fact 
that the major environmental organizations, the national NGOs, EDF, NRDC, and that kind of organization, had made a alliance with the electric utilities and some other big corporations, but primarily the electric utilities, um, to push this cap and trade model, uh, which would have been you know, a huge windfall for these utilities. They would have gotten free permits worth you know, billions of dollars, and uh, we would have wind up, wound up paying the utilities and the energy companies higher prices. Um, anyway, so the, that was the problem. Why what, The reason the CLEAR Act was sort of stymied this last year was that cap and trade sucked up all the oxygen. And, and even though Obama had campaigned in 2008, not for the CLEAR Act per se, because that didn't exist in 2008, but for essentially the same concept of capping uh, emissions, auctioning all the permits, not giving any of them away for free to the polluters, um, and then giving the money back to the people. That's what Obama actually campaigned on in 2008. He folded pretty soon after uh, he took office because all these environmental groups were saying, this is the way to go politically. It's the pragmatic way. We have to buy off these various industry groups. And as, as, as the cap and trade bill progressed, it, it actually passed the House by about five votes, I think in June or July of 2009. Then when it went to the Senate, it hit the, the wall, kind of, and um, they started making all these deals. You know, w once you sort of open the floodgate, you're starting to give away all these uh, freebies and Whatnot, and they had this. They had this other I, key element of that bill was something called offsets. I don't want to get into it because it's all very technical. But uh, it was a, it was another handout to Wall Street, which would have created a huge fiasco had it passed. But they they got into this the political vortex of okay, you know, we bought off this industry, but now that industry is complaining that they didn't get as much as this, so there had to be more for the oil companies more for the coal companies, more for the gas companies, more for Wall Street. And at the end of the day, it was a horror. And um, uh, it didn't pass, I think, fortunately. Um, but as I say, it, 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 it made it impossible for the CLEAR Act to get anywhere. Uh, now that cap and trade has finally crumbled of, of its own grotesqueness, um, there's some space. I mean, there's not a lot of space right now because nothing is going to pass until we have a, a, some kind of a political shift again, alas. But nevertheless, uh, Senator Cantwell and Senator Collins are going to reintroduce the CLEAR Act next year. Uh, I just found this out the other day, talking to their offices. Uh, they are going to have a few more co-sponsors this time. Um, including at least one more Republican. And, and they're going to argue, and especially Senator Collins is going to argue, that um, this cap and dividend model actually is very consistent with Republican principles. It doesn't really increase the size of government. It just takes money that polluters pay and sends it back to the people. There's no government. I mean, the government is brokering the transaction, so to speak. but. Uh, it's just acting like a, it's all done by computer, and um, it doesn't require a bureaucracy, and it's not a tax increase, and you know, so it's a, it's a market solution that happens to be uh, progressive in terms of income uh, redistribution, but that's a good thing. Why why would politicians not even Republican politicians not support something that actually far from being a tax increase, was actually a dividend to their voters, their constituents. So it's not all, it's not over yet. And, um, you know, but the people on Capitol Hill are basically sick of dealing with climate for a while. Uh, you know, we had our opportunities. These opportunities come up, and if 
you know, they don't work, then you have to wait another 10 years or something, as we saw with healthcare and various other things. So it's going to be a while, but uh, the, the cap and dividend model is still viable politically. Yes. Hi, thank you for being here. And uh, I, I just wanted to uh, ask you to comment on um, now, the free market has such global support, and I wondered if you had any views of counterbalancing forces in, um, con in, um, in opposition to uh, Milton Freeman and the University of Chicago's uh, Department of uh, Economics, and wondered what you thought of Naomi Klein's shock doctrine. I didn't read that book, but uh, I've read about it, and... I think she's just onto something there. Uh, and, you know, my understanding of it is that w what she's arguing is that the Milton Friedman types have been very clever in um, having sort of packages ready to go when there's some catastrophe. So, uh, like when Katrina hit, you know, they were all ready to go and say, well, we've got to rebuild the Gulf Coast by privatizing everything, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so, yes, we need to have our uh, responses ready to go the next time there's a Katrina or, you know, some other natural catastrophe, which the BP. We didn't have any response, really, to the BP. There's a good example of... Uh, you know, all that really Obama said, oh, we got to have, uh, you know, more enforcement of safety regulations. But um, that's not really the point, you know. The, the, what the BP disaster showed, why are we out there digging for oil in, you know, five miles deep in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico? It's because we're running out of the easy oil. You know, we're, we're, we're in the era of peak oil, and, and that is the real problem. It's not a safety issue. It's, 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 uh, it's a peak oil issue, and, and which is very analogous to climate. If you deal with, the best way to deal with peak oil is to deal with climate change. I mean, it's the same thing, basically. We've got to get off of fossil fuels, and... You know, if, if Obama had played it differently, that might have been a way to use a crisis to come out with a good solution. Unfortunately, that, that didn't happen. But um, that's, you know, my best answer to your question. Okay. All right. Thanks All right. Very Looks much. like we're out of questions. Yeah. So thank you, Bob. I, I assume Bob Stanza will be back two weeks from now to take back over and and uh, and run this again. So once again, thanks. And I'm sure there'll be a few people that want to come up, uh, yeah. to Peter, and Please ask do. Uh, a little bit of follow-up as you're shutting down here. Yeah. So okay. thank you all. <laughs>